Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, in this final unit, final unit of uh, on Bollywood cinema or as it is popular as Indian cinema is popularly called today, we are going to look at the soft power of Bollywood, the soft power of Indian cinema, uh, which I call the magic of Bollywood at home and abroad. Uh, that is the title of my book of the same name where I explore India's rising soft power through its culture and use Bollywood as an example. So, the magic of Bollywood examines Bollywood as the prime instrument through which Indian soft power is uh, projected throughout the world with a view to understanding the role that culture plays in relations between multicultural, multi-ethnic nations and societies. What is the relationship of culture to nations and na national communities? How do audience located in different nations relate and respond to shared images? And how does this lead to a better understanding of each other? These are the questions I would try to explore. Uh, um, the important um, uh, aspect of in Indian cinema is that it is a national cinema, but unlike other national cinemas, it is unique in its development into national cinema without being either state owned or state controlled. And interestingly, this disavowed cinema, a cinema which was disavowed by the state and the middle class elite until recently, became uh, complicit in the propagation of nationalist ideologies as Madhav Prasad has brilliantly brought out in his book, The Ideology of the Hindi Film and became an important instrument in the production of the nation and the citizen, citizen's subject of modernity. We will not uh, uh, go into this since we have already spoken about the popularity of Indian cinema in the 30s in the Indian diasporas in Fiji, West Indies, Malaya. 50s in South Asia, Sri Lanka, Vietnam, Thailand, Burma, Indonesia, the Middle East, Africa, Russia and beginning in the 90s the movement of Bollywood to Europe, North America and Australia. What I am interested in is uh, the, uh, the impact that it had on not just the Indian diasporas for which it was considered suitable entertainment, but the impact it had, the effect it had on other ethnic groups who got hooked to the pleasures of Indian cinema when it was exported to these countries uh, beginning in the 1930s, the non-Indian groups, the non-Indian uh, diasporas uh, and I am not talking about South Asians, uh, but other ethnic groups. So, the Bollywood fixation of non-South Asian viewers in Nigeria, Ghana, Malaysia and Thailand may be attributed to status interventions that enable the screening of Indian films in cinema halls and the virtual monopoly in these markets in the absence of a Hollywood incursion and the absence of a local industry. So, since there was no local industry, no indigenous industry and uh, Hollywood had not made inroads into these nations. Indian cinema virtually enjoyed a monopoly in these countries and became part of the national imaginary of those nations as well such as Nigeria for instance. Uh, so, in markets like um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, where the state did attempt to protect its industry and citizens from the uh, hegemonic or corruptive influence of Bollywood by banning the import of Bollywood films, citizens devised 
ingenious strategies to evade state regulation by smuggling them, particularly after in the 70s with the video boom and the cassette culture. We met Havara in Russia, we met Havara in China, and we have also met Havara in Turkey. Now, um, let's meet Mera Naam Joker in Tanzania by listening to an interview by a former resident. They produced a lot of malefic things, and my parents, they did. They did like one or two shows a year. That's why I grew up in so that means the Malayali uh, community very was very big. It was very big and very creative. They, you know, they came with Marxist tradition. They produced a lot of Marxist poems. Lingal and a communist Afi, which means you made me a communist. Okay. And there were a couple of Max Life plays they made. And so there was a lot of this stuff going on because, you know, socialist Tanzania, so Kerala politics. It was just very interesting realizing now from the perspective where I'm not realizing. So, so it's just individuals. individuals might have been. Well, they have their own land and therefore they have their own Punjabis and Jirabis. And I think it's because he didn't like my lines too much. You know, my, people went to Bali. My friend, uh, this woman, her editor is Russell. He my generation people married. All the stuff going on, it was like the Malayalis dated Africans. They might have. Individuals might have been. Well, the, 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 the families yeah, are very the close. The families are very close. Very close. Um, but you know, the Ismailis were probably the most integrated because they spoke so really, really well. Really? Dated. So it's funny you're talking because uh, because Vasanji edited this book. So she was like, yeah, you want to stay in the same Tansi was, you know, very much connected to China. So what she's saying is, uh, this is uh, the presence of a large Malayali community in uh, in uh, in Tanzania during this time, and I missed that part where she talks about how they would go to watch uh, they would go to watch films in open a, a theater in Tanzania, where they would meet with other Indian communities, and she watched Mira Nam Joker 13 times, not because she wanted to watch the film, but because because of the forms of sociality that the film produced by getting the Indians together. But what interested me was that uh, along the uh, barbed wire or the boundary wall of the open air theater where Indians would be watching these films and celebrating uh, and uh, performing these community events and affirmations of community, there would be an entire audience of Africans, of the local Tanz uh, Af African people who would be watching the same films from outside the boundaries. Even though they could not follow the dialogues or they, they could even not uh, for listen to hear the dialogues, these, these groups of people on the periphery would be watching the same films and this is how we are talking about the 70s, they acquired a taste for Indian films which they still um, indulge in even today. And now we move to Ghana and in around the same years, but this time we don't have a diasporic person, not a person of Malayali orig origin, but we have a person of African, a, a black person from Africa who shares his experience of having watched Shole in a theater. Uh, yes. Okay. I see what you can see. We are going to start with Shole. Mm -hmm. And whatever you remember of Shole, mm. Amitabh Bachchan mm. is the central, one of the two uh, mm. lovable fruits mm. mm. the cowboy mm. figures. Well, and the, that mm. is, uh, that's what Slumdog and Shole have in, in common. common. Well, the two things that I remember from watching Shole, which is, I must admit, is a very long time ago, is that uh, the film seem to play with the idea of um, the frontier, the frontier hero, which was quite common in the Western, the tradition of the Western, Western, American Western. But of course, the frontier hero of the Western is a particular character type. He has to be rugged, he has to be very masculine, very strong, often also brutal, uh, at least in the, in the tradition of the Western. This 
surely placed with the idea of the frontier, except that uh, the, the, the character that is produced in the face of this frontier is not the same as the character of the Western. It's, uh, the ruggedness is not an exclusive uh, masculine ruggedness. It's rather the ruggedness of someone that is able, or people that are able to constantly recreate themselves. And it's for that the trickster, trickster petty criminality. So the petty criminality in the apparent tricksterhood is not a negative quality. Even though the, the you know, law and order system postulates and posits them as negative, in the larger you know, schema of the film, it is that is the character that they require to survive on this frontier. The, first, the second thing is that the frontier is not a stable frontier, unlike the western frontier, where the frontier is a landscape, is a landscape often desert-like. Mm -hmm. If I remember rightly, surely the surely frontier changes from urban to wider landscape, and there's a theme that was running through of the train. There was a train, and also, uh, yeah. There was a train which keeps moving. So they have several encounters with this train. As I say, speaking from memory, yeah. therefore the frontier, as marked by the train, also uh, weaves together uh, a certain empty landscape with an, a landscape that is already ordered, either ordered in terms of an urban ordering uh, or in terms of uh, an ordering which requires law <laughs> and so on. So that these two characters are necessary for uh, a frontier that is in motion, it's a transitional frontier, so that they are um, tricksterhood and very cleverness and slyness and so on is what is required by this, this kind of mobile and uh, elusive frontier. One might even venture to read this in a larger postcolonial vein of, of uh, a city-state in, in formation or transformation where the different kinds of uh, character types that are required for different dimensions of the postcolony. I don't know. As I said, I'm speaking from vague memory. In fact, these questions actually suggest to me that I should go and revisit surely seriously. No, those memories are very important uh, for me, for the work I'm doing uh, on the transnational flows of Bollywood cinema. Which okay, so here was, um, uh, but uh, we also need to see that there's a difference between the more elite response and here we had a very informed, sophisticated uh, analysis of Shole given by um, someone who is an part of the educated elite of uh, Ghana as was the previous uh, uh, person uh, of Indian origin, of Malayali origin. But uh, the uh, responses uh, apart from this class dimension, we find that there is there are different reasons why people seem to appreciate uh, why they do appreciate Bollywood films, Hindi films in different parts of the world. And now we move on to Singapore and we meet the young couple you met again and we have them singing for you. <laughs> You sing it to your wife? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> okay. So here we see the uses and abuses of Bollywood <laughs> in different parts of the world where this gentleman is singing. Kuch kuch hota hai. This young couple here we met in Jade Cinema yesterday. And uh, now I move on to Joseph Nye's idea of soft power. Uh, his idea, uh, which he developed in his book, Bound to Lean, The Changing Nature of American Power in 1990, which he developed further in Soft Power, The Means to Success in World Politics. And he defines power as the ability to alter the behavior of others to get what you want. There are three ways to do it. Coercion, 
payments and attraction, which is soft power. Now, the, what is soft power? He opposes soft power to hard power and calls soft power the ability to get what you want or to or, without ordering um, others to do rather I don't know why this has got uh, lines have got jumbled for the ability to get what you want others to do through attraction rather than forcing them to do what you want and it's less transfer uh, less transferable less coercive and less tangible than hard power now soft power resources according to nye include intangible power resources such as culture ideology and institutions and it's based on cultural attraction and it has an important uh, role ideology for instance when we talked about american soft power we were talking about how this ideology of consumption or freedom and liberty or the capitalist ideology has an intrins intrinsic appeal for certain people in the world and he thinks it's got a very important role to play in international relations. So uh, now using a nice idea of soft power, we find that Indian films have us with a sprawling idea. Nye himself mentions this when he says Indian films with a sprawling audience across Asia, Middle East and Africa are the cutting edge of the country's soft power. This is what he says. So he does mention so India and Indian films in his understanding of his explanation of what soft power is. And then we have Shashi Tharu. Um, uh, uh, in his earlier uh, position, he's, uh, he's no longer in the ministry, but in his official position, he made this uh, lecture. He, he delivered a lecture in which he, he announced that something much less tans tangible, but a good deal more valuable in the 21st century may be more important than any of them, Indian culture, which is India's soft power. He compared to hard power and he said what is important is India's soft power. And uh, now when we talk about India's soft power, the question we have anecdotal evidence of the popularity of Indian films in different markets across the world. And this, these anecdotal mem uh, evidence are now being corroborated by serious research, by researchers who are compiling data on the popularity of Indian films and authenticating it through interviews to the ethnographic work such as Brian Larkin's work on the, uh, on the, uh, in Benin and in, uh, in uh, Shakuntala Rao's work on in Russia. We have evidence coming from different parts of the world about um, and more concrete de data on how many people uh, I'm in this context I must mention uh, the work on Senegal a uh, Senegal which is a very interesting case because it did not have an Indian diaspora and yet uh, Indian films gained popularity in Senegal among a group called Indofields who are in love with all things in Indian, including Indian dancing, Indian films, Indian cuisine, Indian dress, and so on. So that was a very unusual example of a, of the popularity of uh, Hindi films or Bollywood films in a nation which did not have an Indian diaspora. Now we are not sure about what is the percentage of when we say we are talking about India's soft power and we are talking about Bollywood as con Indian films or Bollywood films as constituting um, India's soft power which the former Prime Minister grudgingly ex uh, expressed in his one of his lectures uh, that uh, this disavowed culture of India, this disavowed cinema of India has now part of India's attractiveness to the rest of the world. The state is forced to take notice of it. Uh, surely because of the power that films have for a number of ethnic groups across the globe. 
but one is still not sure what is the percentage of Bollywood's share in the global market. We are aware, uh, we can certainly say that it is the source of an attractiveness of uh, Bollywood films to certain groups. It certainly constitutes, it is very attractive to certain groups. But can this attractiveness translate into soft power is another question altogether. Now, soft power, as Nai points out, is more effective because it is projected without a propagandist agenda. The absence of an overt propagandist inten intention on the part of the Indian state makes Bollywood a classic in illustration of Nye's notion of soft power, because this was not something which was cultivated consciously by the Indian state through providing financial support to the film industry or by facilitating cultural exchanges. It might have done in, to a limited extent, but the focus of the Indian state has been on the promotion of art house cinema in film festivals or festivals of India and so on rather than commercial cinema. But there must have been some promotion by the state during, uh, during the 50s and 60s which explains the uh, film stars, uh, the popular film actors Raj Kapoor and Narkis Dutt are coming uh, the, the first Prime Minister of India Jawaharlal Nehru to Russia and um, they are becoming household names in Russia. So, there must have been some intervention, some encouragement by the state, but we do, do not have concrete figures. So, this idea of the intentional fallacy of imposing Indian cultural values or South Asian cultural values on the rest of the world is uh, demystified by the idea of in Indian commercial cinema and the commercial cinema as only entertainment, because Indian commercial cinema is driven by the market and its attractiveness is through the market and in spite of the market. So, Bollywood gets what it wants not only by consciously altering the behavior of others, but by its ability to attract diverse audience across different continents, merely by its soft power. So, this belated recognition of Bollywood's soft power came from Virendra Gupta, who says that the new overseas centers fall within the matrix of our overall foreign policy in which soft power culture is a major component and the expansion of cultural presence is one of the new goals of India's foreign policy. Now, who is watching Bollywood films and where? Due to the unconventional dissemination media and exhibition spaces through which Bollywood films continue to invade unimaginable spaces, official figures on their distribution and screening cannot serve as reliable guides for the projection of their soft power. So, if you were to look at the abysmal uh, quantitative figures data on how many people are watching Bollywood films and what was the export of Indian films over, the uh, over nearly a century, we would not really get the right figures because as we have seen that Indian films leak through unofficial channels channels which were not supported by the state and which were not formal and which lie on the cusp of legality and illegality. So, the symbolic importance of Indian films we can say far exceeded the number of films exported even in the 50s. And how is this? So, problem with what is the pro problem with soft power? Soft power is diffi difficult to quantify and it works in unexpected ways. It must be married to hard power. So, it is Indian films we can say are attractive beyond doubt. The ability of the attractiveness of the ideology of the Hindi film to set the political agenda and determine the framework of debate in a way that shapes others preferences is corroborated by recent research such as Brian uh, Larkin's research in parts of Africa among the Hausa youth, Muslim Hausa youth in Africa, who seem to prefer Hollywood, Bollywood films to Hollywood films, because it gives them a template 
a model for forming what Lacan calls parallel modernities, uh, modernities which are not shaped in conjunction with the modernities projected in American or Western modernities uh, showcased or uh, uh, underpinning the Hollywood film, but other kinds of modernities which may be emulated by people in the post-colonial world such as Nigeria or even Pakistan where uh, there is a distant identification in identification while uh, Muslim youth in Pakistan would disidentify with the Hindu ideology of the uh, Hindi films. They still uh, identify with the with the kind of modernity which marries tradition, uh, traditional values with modern West, uh, Western values, they would identify with this to form a new form of Pakistani modernity. So one of the main forms that soft power assumes is ideology. And uh, we can look at the relationship between the ideology of Hindi cinema and its rising soft power. It is attractive no doubt, but why do people find Bollywood films attractive? Considering that commercial Bollywood filmmakers are not driven by any political agendas or ideological imperatives and the desire to control nothing other than entertainment industry uh, nationally or inter internationally, it is more important to investigate the source of Bollywood's attractiveness to a significant proportion of the world population. So why are different people attracted to Bollywood films? How is a youth in Nigeria to form parallel modernities as Larkin pointed out uh, to their identification um, with the uh, modernity projected in Indian films while they might disidentify with the Hindu ideologies, the mu Muslim youth in Pakistan for instance. And we have another set of people. So, beginning with the attractiveness of Indian films for Hausa youth in Nigeria, we move to the attractiveness of Shah Rukh Khan films in, uh, or new Bollywood sh films, particularly Shah Rukh Khan films in Germany because of their exotic appeal, because of the techno nostalgia of uh, post industrial societies such as Germany for uh, rustic. Uh, uh, rustic cultures which are depicted uh, often depicted in many of these films or more so for the attraction of Hindu family values in nations where family values are breaking down. Can attractiveness translate into soft power? Now that is a question I leave you with. The inability of films to intervene in international relations. Uh, have they really have they really changed? Has soft power, has the attractiveness of Indian soft power to uh, of soft power of in Bollywood films to pa Pakistani youth have really improved the relations between India and Pakistan, though that is the aspiration on both sides of the border. Have they en really ended cross border terrorism? Have they, there seems to be a contradictory tra trend. So, what one needs to do is to marry soft power with hard power, which Nye calls defines as smart, smart power in the modification of his original idea of soft uh, power. Now, I leave you with another, um, <coughs> we conclude with this.
Come on. Yeah. Okay. Really? We know somebody who knows Shah Rukh Khan? Handsome. Handsome? Yeah. What's your name? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. You think he is handsome? Yeah. How old are you? I'm 13 years old. 13 years old. And where did you see Shah Rukh Khan? Yeah, I like Shah Rukh Khan. You like Shah Rukh Khan? I like Shah Rukh Khan. I like Shah Rukh Khan. Shah Rukh Khan. Yeah. Karina? Yes, I like to, but it's very cute, so cute. It's cute? Yeah. But you are so cute. Yeah, thank you. So, are you sing for me? I don't tell you. No. I don't dance for you. Maybe one night, one night. Maybe I don't dance for you. Okay, nobody is easy. He's gone. Now you sing. Bullet. Bullet, Julia. Bullet, Kangana. Hi, me, who gives me a little sanjana. So, we have... 15 year old Koma and her sister 13 year old Ilu in a shrine, so, uh, these teenage souvenir sellers in a shrine in Bali who share with, the, with their German counterparts their love for Shah Rukh Khan. They believe he's extremely handsome and they also know all the names of all the fil Hindi film actors. So there's a class divide, there's a regional divide from the global north, we move to the global south. but the lo what what is common is the love for Shah Rukh Khan in, in <laughs> among people of different classes, genders, um, uh, nationalities across the world, from Koma uh, in in uh, uh, Bali to Michelle in Australia and young women in Germany all seem to be big fans of Shah Rukh Khan. Will this really translate into a soft smart power, we do not know, but Bollywood films are certainly attractive to a large number of people in the world. <laughs>